He's being the preacher. But uh, it's good to see everybody tonight. Glad that you're here. Uh, continue to remember all those that were that are dealing with COVID right now. There are a lot that are still at home. There are some that are at home really sick right now that are in need of prayers, uh, that are dealing with a lot of things. Um, I know we got some in the hospital and some at uh, home that are just trying to get over that. So just remember them. We are happy to have Mr. Larry Waymeyer uh, and also his wife Carol. Uh, they come from Lexington, Tennessee, and they are here to tell us about Haiti. And I know actually that we ourselves have prayed for Haiti because Haiti has been going through quite a bit uh, with the assassination of the president, just upheaval and, and struggles going on, especially hurricanes and different things. I know Mr. Larry's going to, Brother Larry's going to bring up uh, a lot of those things tonight and talk about some of that. And so we're happy to have him and happy to support this work. And so we're going to get started with prayer and we will then go and do our, uh, our singing. So let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we thank you so much for all that you do. We're so thankful that you've blessed us and helped us with everything that we need in life. We know that we're not alone, and we know that you've blessed us with so many wonderful spiritual blessings in the heavenly places, that you have given us all these things. And we just ask you that you please help us to open our eyes and open up our hearts to your word and to your message, to open up our eyes and open up our hearts to opportunities in which we can help those all around us. Dear Lord, we're so thankful for Larry and Carol and their, and their work that they do in Haiti, and we're so thankful for them and that their willingness to come and to tell us about that work to come and to, and to share in that ministry that they're doing. And we just ask your many blessings on them to give them a spirit of wisdom and understanding, to give them a spirit of, of graciousness and peace. And we're just so thankful that you have blessed them and, and helped them through so many years of your service. Dear Lord, we do ask that you, that you bless those in Haiti right now through so many struggles and so many heartaches and all the things that they're dealing with. We just ask you that you just please guide them and just help them and to be a shining beacon of light for them. That you help the Christians that are in that area. That you give them just a spirit of fearlessness and a spirit of courage. That you help them and guide them through all the things that they're dealing with. Dear Lord, we're just so thankful that you have given us the Son of God. That you've given us Jesus Christ. That we might worship him and that we might think of him. That he, that he will always be with us. And dear Lord, just help us to always remember him in everything that we do. It's in your wonderful son's name that we pray. Amen. Hey. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. First song this evening will be, Oh, to be like thee. Oh, to be like thee. I'll sing the first and last verse of this song. Oh, to be like thee, blessed be thee. This is my constant longing and prayer. Gladly I'll forfeit all of us treasures. Jesus, thy perfect likeness to wear. Oh, to be like thee, oh, to be like thee, blessed be
Your only Son, no sin to hide, but you have sent Him from your side to walk upon this guilty Son and to become the Lamb of God. Your gift of love. song invitation tonight will be just as I am just as I am song before scripture ends in our lesson will be Jesus let us come to know you Jesus let us come to know you Jesus let us Oh, uh-huh. 
might have hung up on him. There we go. I told Mike, Mike's with uh, his mom and dad, Doris and Shelby, tonight, and uh, they wanted to wanted me to FaceTime them so they could see what we were talking about, too, but they send their greetings to you, and it is great to be here tonight as we come together to share in the study of God's Word, and I share with you some of the things that we're doing down in Haiti and some of the needs that's there. Uh, do covet your prayers because they certainly need them, as you'll see, before the night's over. But what a joy it is to be back here at Mount Zion. I know that if it wasn't for COVID and other sicknesses, that there would be more people here. But that's the same way it is back home. That's the same way it is everywhere we go right now. We live in a changed world. But we are blessed to be able to use things like YouTube and uh, Facebook and other means of being able to reach out to family members and encouraging them as they, since they cannot come out, and certainly some people that have immune problems, then certainly they don't need to be out uh, that much. And so, but we're glad that you're here tonight. Glad that you chose to be here tonight as we share in the study of God's Word. I'm thankful for the elders and preacher that works with this congregation and is giving up the pulpit tonight. I appreciate that very much. You know, it's hard to believe that it was 42 years ago that I first came to Mount Zion. Uh, time gets away in a hurry. I don't know where it goes. I look around and some of you have gotten older, but I don't think I have. And so, now I think we all begin to show those years as time goes on. But we wouldn't want it any other way because that gets us one more step closer to heaven. And that's what we're looking for on that final day is when, when we can stand before God and hear him say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Tonight I want to share with you, let's see if I'm getting this thing turned on right. There we go. Uh, as we look at our lesson tonight, you know, one of the things that I want us to, and I try to emphasize wherever we go, is that we can't forget the mission of the church. You know, our mission is to evangelize the world. Our mission is to bring people into Jesus Christ. The Bible says that we are to go, Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's our mission. And so whatever we do in life, whatever we do on a mission field, whether it's helping people that need shelter or helping people that need food or medicine or whatever the case is, the end goal is to teach them about Jesus Christ and to set that Christ example, Christ-like example before them so that they can see Christ living in us. Because it's one thing to get somebody well. It's another thing to get some give somebody food to fill their, their belly, bellies and to nourish their bodies. It's another thing to put shelter over somebody's head. But the most important thing is to bring them to the body of Christ. Bring them to the kingdom of God so that they can have the hope of an eternal home with him in heaven. Our mission is not only to evangelize, but to help others so that they can help others as well. And just emphasizing what is in the, the red here, what you have heard and trust the faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You see, that's God's plan for evangelizing the world. Teach others to teach others to teach others and let the gospel continue to spread. It wasn't just the apostles during the first century that preached the gospel, that spread the gospel throughout the known world at that time. But the Bible tells us in the book of Acts that after the persecution started and Stephen was stoned to death, that the Christians were scattered everywhere preaching the word. You see, it was members of the body of Christ. It wasn't just the apostles. The apostles, as a matter of fact, stayed there. But the members took the gospel wherever they went. They went back to their home countries and their, their home uh, towns, wherever it might be. And they took that message of Christ with them. And that's what we must do. 
is take the message of Christ wherever we go, whether it's to school or to work or to Haiti or wherever it might be. We take the same message, and that's the message of salvation. To give you an idea of some of the things that we are doing down in Haiti right now, and I've been working in Haiti since 2010, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's strange how certain people come into your life at certain times and it alters the direction that you're going. You know, when I was still stationed over in Germany and Mike and I were uh, worshiping together in the church over there and we were uh, working with the young people and I decided to uh, go into preaching, uh, IBC wasn't on my mind at that time, or Heritage as it's known now. Wasn't on my mind at the time. I was headed to Texas. And then Mike started telling me about IBC, and then he told me about Mount Zion, and now we've had a, a over 40 years of friendship with this congregation. And what a blessing that is. Well, that's kind of the way it was with the work down in Haiti. While Carol and I have worked on many islands in the Caribbean, somewhere around 25 islands, uh, throughout the Caribbean and, and helping to plant congregations and working with congregations when I had no plans to go to Haiti. But in February of 2010, the earthquake had taken place in January and I saw two preacher friends of mine and they said, we need you to go to Haiti. And I said, okay, when do you need me to go? And this was on a Monday afternoon about five o'clock and Jesse said, I will get your ticket tonight. You leave it out of Nashville, 6 o'clock Wednesday morning. So I said, all right, I'll go. And I've been going ever since. And what a blessing it's been. Uh, some of the brethren that we have in Haiti are some of the strongest, some of the most faithful, some of the most dedicated, some of the most loving Christians that I've ever met. And so those introductions that we have and those People that we know in our lives sometimes can make a world of difference. Well, you can make a world of difference in somebody else's life as well. But that was the start of our work down in Haiti. Now, one of our primary goals is to train preachers. For the first three and a half years that we were in Haiti, I was working with the relief program. The Estes congregation, which is about 30 miles from us, started receiving money uh, after the earthquake of 2010 that claimed somewhere between 250 and 300,000 lives. And so they asked me if I would oversee those funds being spent on the ground. And so I made regular trips at least once a month, if not more, going back and forth to Haiti. And uh, during the first three and a half years, we were able to feed over 10,000 people a month for uh, and provide food for them. We took medical teams down, provided medical aid. We were able to help rebuild homes. We rebuilt church buildings. There was just many, many different works that we were able to do. And during the relief effort, the gospel was being preached the whole time. And we had baptized more than 3,000 people into the body of Christ. Uh, many of the denominational churches in that area uh, came to know the truth and put aside man-made doctrines and went back to the Word of God. And that's what our goal is, is to bring people in that direction. One of the needs that grew out of that was trained preachers. So we started the International School of Theology in Haiti. This is a um, extension school of the Bear Valley Bible Institute uh, out of Denver, Colorado. So we get teachers from there sometimes as well and work with them closely. But we started the school, so we're training uh, preachers and teachers. And I put teachers in there because not everybody wants to be a preacher that goes to a Bible school. Uh, we have women that attend our Bible school in Haiti. And they said, we don't want to be preachers. We know we can't get up and preach. But we're teachers of God's Word, and we want to be better teachers. And so we have four women uh, attending our school right now. We also do church planting. There's been, uh, this year, there's been uh, one co new congregation. Last year, we had five new congregations planted. And so we planted somewhere around 30 congregations throughout uh, different parts of Haiti. We continue to uh, train our preachers. They come back to campus from time to time. Uh, church leaders conferences. As a matter of fact, this past weekend, there was one that was taking place in Haiti, which I could have been there for it. Had about 70 people, it looked like, on the video 
uh, that I got from it. Uh, Student-led campaigns, our students are busy going out and knocking on doors, even during times of trouble. They're still out there reaching out, trying to teach the Word of God. Then evangelistic efforts through Healing Hands International. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them or not. They're out of Nashville. Uh, it's a church of Christ organization. Uh, all the people that work there are members of the Lord's Church. But they travel mostly to Africa and to Haiti, and they drill wells, and they provide clean water for people. One of our students that graduated last year is working closely with them, and wherever they drill a well, then he is there to work with people in the community. He takes students with him from time to time, and they evangelize in that area. If there's already a congregation in that area, they work with that congregation and to, to try and build that congregation up and find new people for that congregation. And then if there's not a congregation, then they start working to try to plant a congregation in that area. And so it's a very effective program. And then we do benevolent and education as well. Uh, Sunlight Children's Home, some of you may have heard of Roberta Edwards. Uh, she was there for a long, long time. And then when she died, uh, one of our graduates, Brother Marshall Vissier, uh, as a matter of fact, he was in our home just last week. Uh, his daughter just uh, came to the States, and she's a, a student at Fried Hardeman University now in Henderson. And so we're really proud of her and proud of that family. He's doing a fantastic job. Pre-pandemic, now hopefully we'll be able to start this again in the future, but medical clinics, uh, medical teams that would go down, food assistance, we're doing a lot of that right now. A milk program, we provide milk not only for our children's home that we work with, the Sunlight Children's Home, but for several children's homes and schools in that area. And then educational programs, we have people who support some of our students uh, that are in elementary all the way on up through uh, college age. Uh, we've had uh, young people who have graduated from the, or left the uh, children's home and gone on to be doctors, teachers, nurses, different uh, areas of work. And so we're thankful for that. But on July the 7th of this year, a lot of things changed. And that was because the president, uh, Luis, was assassinated and there's been civil unrest ever since. Well, it's, it's magnified since that time. Uh, about two years ago, the UN was there and they had been there for about 15 years. They pulled out. And so the gang activity began to increase. It has steadily increased. Since the assassination of the president, it's continued to increase. And so pray for Haiti because there's a lot of unrest that is there. There's uh, trouble in Haiti. As you can see, sometimes we have extremely large demonstrations, literally thousands upon thousands of people. And just as it is here in the States, many of these people are, are peace-loving. They just want better changes, better lives for themselves. Uh, but anytime you have demonstrations going on like this, or many times, you have that smaller element that comes in to cause trouble. And that's many times what happens when a large demonstration begins to take place like this. Uh, rock throwing, car burning, burning of uh, homes, different things that are taking place. And so it makes it very, very difficult. Now then, the recent earthquake that took place uh, happened uh, about two months ago or a little over a month ago. And it was in this area over here. Let's see if I can figure out how to do this. Well, I don't see the... It's just a straight line. Straight line. line. Oh, there it is. There it is. Well, I don't think it's working. Or I'm, I'm not getting it to work anyway. But I can show you from here. Uh, this is the area where the uh, earthquake took place. This is the area of IST. This is where our school is over in this area here, which is about 70 miles away. And so there was no damage done to our school. All of our students are uh, okay. All of our teachers are okay. And we're so thankful for that, that the Lord uh, watched out over them. But 22 people lost their life. I've been out in that area before. My daughter went with me uh, one time and her husband. And it's only from where the Red Square is, where the school is, all the way out to the points, only about 120 miles. 
but it took us 15 hours to get there uh, because of the conditions of the road or the non-conditions of the road. Uh, some areas we had to make the roads, but what a blessing it was to go out there. I remember one time we were in an area called Zai, and uh, we were having morning worship service, and we we're out at, literally in the bush, out among no man's land, uh, and, but yet we had nearly 300 people show up for worship. Dirt floors, uh, palm leaf walls, palm leaf roof, uh, but we had over, right around 300 people to come. And they brought their own chairs because they don't have chairs there or benches, uh, pews like we have. And so people, if they wanted to sit down, they brought their own uh, seat to sit on. And uh, what a blessing it was. We had 21 baptisms after that service that day. And the church is still going strong in that area. One of the men that was converted out there has planted 12 uh, congregations that he's working with. And we're so thankful for him. But you can see all the other damage that was done. Over 12,000 uh, were injured, 50,000 homes and businesses were destroyed, uh, 77,000 damaged, uh, 60 places of worship, and this is not just the church, but uh, denominational uh, churches as well, 20 schools, 25 health centers, uh, in addition to that, about uh, 48 um, other places were destroyed or, or injured, and these are homes where children are located. Uh, there's about 750 children's homes in Haiti. A lot of that is brought on because of the natural disasters that take place. The parents die, somebody has to take care of the children. And so there's a lot of that that takes place down in Haiti. These are some of the pictures of the recent earthquake, and certainly the, the pictures do tell the story of how horrible it was and how frightening it was. And there will be more uh, in the future, most likely, because where they are located is, is close to a fault line. And so uh, there's continually uh, earthquakes that are taking place. and. I've got some handouts that I will give to you. I'll, I'll put them on the uh, table in the back, and you can pick one of those up, and it tells more about the condition of the earthquakes and how many they've had since this one took place uh, because they continue to have those aftershocks that continue to go on and on. Uh, but aid is getting through. Some aid is getting through. Let me put it that way. Uh, this is at the church building in Jeremy where the earthquake took place. The church building was not damaged too badly. Uh, they're still able to meet there, still able to work there. We've been able to get some funds down. And so food is getting in slowly but surely. Uh, we've been in constant contact with our preacher that's in this area that's handling the distribution of funds. And so we're thankful that he is there and we know that he will do a great job. Uh, his name is St. Louis. Uh, you spell it just like you would St. Louis. Uh, but it's pronounced St. Louis. And he uh, is the one that planted the 12 congregations in that area. A great, dedicated gospel preacher. He went to one village when he first started planting congregations. And they literally ran him out of town throwing rocks at him. Uh, he had walked there about four hours to get there. They ran him out of town throwing rocks at him. The next week he went back. Today there's a congregation there. His determination, his steadfast love of the Lord uh, motivated him to continue to do what needed to be done. So we're thankful that he is there and doing the work that he is doing. Give you an idea of what we're looking at when we go to Haiti. This is a map of Alabama. And Alabama is 52,423 square miles. Haiti is 10,714. So Alabama is about five times bigger than the land mass in Haiti. And to give you an idea of how many people we're dealing with, about 27% of the Caribbean population lives in Haiti. And the orange part of Alabama at the top is about one-fifth of Alabama. And if you were to move everybody from Tennessee, and according to the number I found, we've got 6,829,000 people 
in Tennessee. Alabama has uh, 5,024,279, which gives us a grand total of 11,853,279 people. And if you took all of those people and you put them just in the orange area, and then you turn off about 70% of the electricity, about 70% of the water, uh, have uh, no sewage uh, processing in that area, uh, only a few hospitals that can be used, then, and, and throw in on top of that about 70% or so of unemployment. That's what we're dealing with when we go to Haiti. Extreme, extreme poverty. The last time I checked, Haiti was the fourth poorest country in the world. Uh, most people live off of less than two dollars per day, and so it, it's it's not a luxurious island as some might think. Now it's a beautiful place. There are some beautiful, beautiful places in Haiti, but there is a tremendous need that is there, and that need is the gospel, and that's what we're trying to do. When we first started school in 2014, we had rented a place. And it was costing us about $15,000 a year. And I thought, well, if we find a place that we can buy, then we might be able to take that same amount of money and pay it. And then eventually it'll be ours. And it will be, you know, we won't have to pay that rent. We can use that money for something else. So we found this piece of property. Sister Roberta helped us find this piece of property. And those tower-looking things that you're seeing in there, uh, that is uh, uh, wrought iron, that is... Uh, sticking out of the ground. That's what the columns were going to be going on. There was a house there. There was a foundation there. And it was exactly uh, the layout that we wanted. So we felt like that the Lord's providence had worked out that for us. And so we were able to buy this. I spoke to one man and, uh, who was a lawyer friend of mine down in Haiti. And I asked him, I said, well, how much do you think we'll have to pay for this piece of property? It's about three acres. And he said, you won't get this for less than $250,000. Uh, property on an island, wherever the island is, is extremely high uh, because they're just not making any more of it, and it's limited. And so we, I said, well, we're, I'm going to offer her 100000 see if she'll take it. And she did. And so we were thankful that the Lord brought us to this point. It had, with the foundation, the house that was on it, uh, little things like a light pole uh, for us to get our electricity there. It had a deep water well already uh, drilled on the property that saved us all of that saved us probably between forty and fifty thousand dollars right there and so it was a blessing to be able to get this and so we started working on it raising money and uh, little by little and we we paid for it as we went uh, we still owe a little bit on the other but we paid for it as we went uh, we hired local people to come and to do the work uh, that way we provided an income for a lot of people in the community that we were going to be reaching out to with the gospel. And uh, the day that we poured the roof, it's about 6,500 square feet. And they poured this roof in one day's time in about an 8 to 10 hour uh, period and uh, with one gallon buckets. Uh, somebody said, well, wouldn't it have been easier just to get a pump truck to come out there? Which we could have done. They have pump trucks in Haiti as well. And it would have been, but it would have cost us about the same. But this way, we provided income for about 50 families in that community for a couple of days. And what a blessing that was to be able to do that. But we had people mixing the concrete, and then you see the men in the top picture going up the ladder. Uh, they would hand the buckets to them. The buckets would go up the ladder. They'd be poured out. Other people would be spreading it. And then it was just a, a continuous cycle going round and around. But we're so blessed to have the facility that we have uh, to do with what we're doing. Uh, let's see, that, there it is. I, I passed one up here. This is the building that we have now. The top right-hand corner is that building that you saw just a few moments ago. Uh, now we have three nice-sized classrooms, two offices, restrooms, a pavilion uh, for the church to meet in, a house uh, for our caretakers, and a place for our students to come where they can uh, study and learn the Word of God. We are so blessed to have this. Unfortunately, because of the unrest that is taking place right now, they are not using this facility. Uh, a lot of gang activity is happening out in this area, 
And so the directors, the local directors that we have of the school, felt like that it would probably be best not to meet there because it would draw attention to the property. And so they started meeting in a home, uh, what we call a guest house. It's a house that we took our, uh, that the church owns, that we would go down when we took medical teams in big groups down. We'd stay there, we could sleep, sleep 36 people in that home on bunk beds. And uh, so they started meeting there, but that was cracked a, a little bit more in this earthquake. So now they're moving again to the children's home and we've got a pavilion there and they'll be separating, setting up partitions and be having classes there. But the classes are continuing. They started last week. But we've got some great men and women who are willing to uh, preach and to teach the word of God. These are our directors, Brother uh, Bobwin, that is on this side, Orjan Bobwin. Uh, he is a police officer. Uh, he has had to flee the, uh, flee the country as well because of threats to his life. He's a great man. He's a dedicated Christian. When he first became a Christian, he wanted me to go with him to Jeremy and to spread the gospel. He came by the house one day. He and his wife had his Bible in his hand with tears in his eyes. He said, this is pure gold. I've got to take it to my family. And at that time, I was heavy in the relief effort. and We just could not get away. So he went. And he's the one that converted St. Louis. St. Louis is the one who has planted all the congregations in that area. And so the Lord works in, in ways that maybe we don't understand sometimes, but a dedicated Christian man. Brother Felix on the far side is a uh, gospel preacher. He's been preaching for about 40 years. A director of a uh, preschool and an elementary school. Uh, he has been working in the what's called the City Soleil area. In 2006, City Soleil was considered the most dangerous place in the world to be. He's had to leave that area three different occasions because of threats to his life, but he continues to go back and to preach and to teach the Word of God. It was men like this that we wanted to be the head of the school down in Haiti. Men that we could trust. Men that we knew were rooted and grounded in the faith and that they would stand firmly on the Word of God. Both of them also graduated from our school of preaching. These are our teachers, Brother uh, St. Joubert. Uh, you uh, just mentioned him, Brother Felix. Brother Marshall Vissier in the middle on the top. Uh, he is the director of the children's home, a gospel preacher. Uh, we started a congregation on the campus at school, so he preaches there. Uh, is also the director of our children's home, uh, just a very dedicated Christian. Uh, Jean-Claude Lemon, he is our, what we would, I guess, refer to in the States as an administrator, also a teacher. He has a degree in uh, education. Uh, teaches French, or he did teach French in the high schools. Maybe, uh, I think he still does some of that. Brother Gillick, Jean-Franc Gillick, uh, he is our Greek teacher. Uh, been teaching Greek and not only at uh, IST, but other schools uh, for about 30 years. Brother Demostain is uh, a unique individual. He's also a graduate. All of these, except for Brother Gillick, are graduates from our school. But he travels about four hours each way to teach uh, his classes. He comes three days a week. And so he's four hours to get there. Classes last four to five hours, and then he takes, takes him four hours to get back home. Very dedicated to the work. Very dedicated to the congregation that he's working with. He's been preaching for over 20 years. Uh, Sophia uh, Felix, uh, she teaches our law classes. She's also our secretary. She's also the director of a, a kindergarten and uh, has a degree in law. And so we're thankful that she is there and helping us to work through some of the issues that we have to work through from time to time. Top left-hand corner is a picture of the congregation. When we started the, the congregation in, at the school, uh, on opening day, we had over 500 people that came, 517 to be exact, uh, people that came to hear the word of God being presented. There's a congregation of about 100 members that was meeting there, but because of the uh, pandemic and because of the trouble that has taken place in Haiti, right now the congregation, they have broken up into different homes. They still get together some, 
but it's mostly in their homes that they are meeting now. Uh, so pray for peace. Uh, these are our 2021 students, uh, or at least some of them. This was the seventh year. We just started the eighth year of, of training preachers and teachers. Some great people. I wish you could meet every one of them. Last year, we had 238 baptisms through our teachers and our uh, students. We, that brought us to a total of about 1,450 uh, people that had been baptized into the body of Christ by our students and our teachers. Uh, five new congregations last year. So far through June of this year, we've had 112 baptisms, and that brought us to about 1,562. So we're so thankful for these men and women who are not afraid, not ashamed to go out and to preach the gospel. And the preachers there, most of them do not get any salary because uh, congregations can't afford it. They may have a congregation of two or three hundred members, but the contribution may only be twenty or thirty dollars. And so it's enough to buy communion supplies. And if they have a generator for lights, then they may have that. None of the buildings have air conditioning or anything like that in them. Many of the congregations will meet early in the morning. And when I say early, I'm talking about between five and six in the morning. To beat the sun uh, before the sun begins to beat down on the tin roofs and it gets so hot under it you can't hardly stand it. Uh, but we're so thankful that they are there, thankful for the work that they are doing. And I've met so many good people, good congregations that are there. And uh, this brings us to our last slide, it brings us right back to where we started. Paul, in speaking to the about the church or about the Israelites, says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them uh, witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. It's not enough just to be excited about being a Christian. We've got to have knowledge. You know, our relationship with God is not based on feelings. Our relationship with God is based on our understanding who God is, what God has done for us through His Son, what Jesus offers us, when we come into his family, when we obey the gospel, it, it shows us, and, and as we study the word of God that is brought to us by the, the Holy Spirit, we grow closer and closer to him. And we understand more and more of who he is and how much he loves us. Now I can remember when I was a child and mom and daddy, when they got ready to correct me, you know, it wasn't just, you know, time out thing back then. It was a cotton stalk or a belt or, or something else, you know, that they would straighten you out with. And so we knew what that what was going to happen. And so growing up, you know, I didn't cherish those moments <laughs> as none of us would. But as I grow, grew older, I understood more and more their love because I learned to know them and how much they loved me and wanted me to be a good person. Well, you see, that's the way it is with our relationship with God. The more you study the Word of God, the more your faith is going to grow, the more you will understand His tremendous love for you. The Bible tells us, How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without someone preaching? And how shall they preach unless they are sin. You see, it takes those who are willing to go, like Brother St. Louis, Brother Baldwin, Brother Felix, others that are working in that area and around the world. It takes people who are willing to go right here in your own community of Mount Zion to reach out to lost souls. But it also takes those of us who are willing to, to help others to go, to help others to preach, to help others to teach the Word of God. And so I want to thank you for your dedication, but maybe you're here tonight, and maybe you've never obeyed the gospel. Maybe you've never given your life to God. Maybe you've given your life to God, but for some reason you've drifted back into the world. We see God's word tells us exactly what we need to do. And when your preacher stands before you, or your elders, or Bible class teachers stand before you, they don't preach anything that we don't preach down in Haiti. We don't preach anything in Haiti that they do not preach right here. And that's the gospel, the word of God. The Bible tells us that if we're not a child of God, we can become one by giving our life to Christ, putting our trust in him, 
turning from our sins, being immersed in that watery grave of baptism, putting on Christ as our Lord and Savior, and then walking day in and day out in our faith with Him. Now some people say, well, I, can you really be faithful all your life? I believe you can. Once you become a Christian, I believe you can be faithful. Now if you're looking to be perfect, no, you're not going to be perfect. But the Bible tells us in the uh, book of 1 John chapter 1 that if you walk in the light as he is in the light, his blood cleanses us from all sin. You see, the blood of Jesus Christ is there for us. I'm thankful that we don't have to be perfect, but we can be faithful. Faithful to God, striving every day to walk a little bit closer to him and to do his will. Maybe you're here tonight and for some reason the, the world has pulled you aside and you've drifted away. And tonight you want to come back home. Tonight you want to renew your love and your commitment to God. If we can help you in any way, we invite you to come as together we stand and as we sing. Just as I am.